But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me. According to your unfailing love, cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven you all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
wives. Yet God has a little different take on it than James tells us who is really wise and where wisdom comes from. Who among you is wise and intelligent? Let him by his good way of living show you that he does things in wise humility. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast and lie contrary to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is worldly, unspiritual, and demonic. In fact, where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder in every bad practice. But the wisdom that comes from above is first pure, then also peaceful, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and the harvest of righteousness is shown in peace by those who practice peace. This is the epistle of our Lord. Alleluia, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Alleluia. <laughs> Sins, there would be a problem with it. 
Jesus said, others first, huh? And so he flipped the box on them and said, others first. I think it was my aunt that told me, and I'll use this in the sermon as well. Some have said that, you want to put the, think of the interests of others, think of joy. Jesus first, others second, yourself last. Jesus says, the, last, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. God wants us to be servants, to serve. Not to serve ourselves, but to serve others. We pray. Dear Heavenly Father, it's so easy for us to look after our own interests, to think about ourselves before other people. Help us to get over that selfishness, to realize that uh, you have done so much for us. You have lived a perfect life and died on the cross. You showed us how you put others first and not your concerns. Help us to see that you want us to serve and to be uh, servants of all, that we consider ourselves uh, in second place, in last place even. Those are the ones that you would exalt. Help us to be humble and to think of others. In Jesus' name we pray. We begin by singing the next
morning is from Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 11. Since most of the verses are included in uh, the, uh, the message, I will not read them. Your friends in Christ. Robert Schuller was an American Christian televangelist, pastor, uh, motivational speaker, and author. After studying at Hope College, he received his Master of Divinity degree from Western Theological uh, Seminary, uh, both in Holland, in 1950. He was ordained as a minister in the Reformed Church of America. In 1955, he started Garden Grove Community Church, southeast of Los Angeles, in a drive-in movie theater. As the congregation grew, Schuler purchased land, and the new church permitted him to preach his sermons to 500 people in cars and to members inside the church. In 1968, the Tower of Hope, a 130 to 150 foot building and the tallest structure in Orange County at the time was added to this drive-in uh, building. It was topped by a 90 foot illuminated cross. That same year he purchased land uh, north of the Garden Grove Community Church to construct the Crystal Cathedral, which was named because of its glass walls and ceiling. Robert Schuller was chiefly known for his weekly Hour of Power television program, which he hosted from 1970 until his retirement in 2010. From the Crystal Cathedral, Pastor Schuller was seen and heard internationally on Sundays as the world's most widely watched hour-long service, that Hour of Power. Reverend Schuller emphasized what he believed are the positive parts of the Christian faith. He purposely avoided uh, talking about condemning sin and people's sins, uh, believing that Jesus met needs before touting creeds. Once in a relationship with Christ, Schuler emphasized a person who sows positive faith in his heart will commit less sins in his life. He often said sin is a condition before it is an action. Schuler urged Christians and non-Christians to achieve great things through God and to believe in your dreams. He wrote, if you can dream it, you can do it. In other words, a lot of what Pastor Schuler preached was for me and how a person can change their life. Like other, other empires, Dr. Schuler's Crystal Cathedral Ministries collapsed after he stepped down as the primary pastor in uh, 2006. Crushing debt from lavish overspending, uh, following uh, or emphasizing a me ministry, a uh, changing religious broadcast industry, a focus uh, on, on an aging audience, and a mishandling of uh, the family succession of uh, the ministry all contributed to, to uh, them filing for bankruptcy in 2010. A charismatic shepherd. Dr. Schuler was an apostle of positive thinking and proclaimed a hopeful message of self-healing and self-empowerment instead of proclaiming a message of law and gospel and how change comes through God's grace and love. The Cathedral Cathedral was sold to the Roman Catholic Diocese of Orange County in 2012. Last week we reviewed how uh, there is a, uh, what a physical uh, tug of war is and what a figurative tug of war is and even what a spiritual tug of war is. We saw how it's best not to lean to one side or the other. The first set of opposing views that we looked at was style versus substance. Today we are going to look at me versus Jesus. So centering our lives on ourselves is spiritually, our religious lives on ourselves is spiritually dangerous. And yet today in society, there are many temptations to think of me, to ignore the needs of others, and not to interact or communicate uh, God, with God or others. First, there's a consumer mentality within all of us. Todd Kunzman, Kunzman thinks uh, part one is about owning material items or constantly consuming them. Many want the latest, the newest, the largest, uh, or we lose interest very fast. But this triggers a vicious cycle of constantly spending money to fulfill those desires. A quote from Earl Rogers very accurately says, too many people spend money they 
haven't earned, to buy things they don't want, to impress people they don't like. In addition to wanting to fill the void of becoming bored with these possessions, it is typically also to do a few other things. Some people want to keep up with the Joneses, that is, A.K. not get left behind what others have. Secondly, some fulfill, uh, fulfill some instant gratification. I can't live without it, I need it now. The third one is need to impress others of all my things, showing off. Look what I've got, I'm the latest thing I've got. Huh? And the fourth, addicted to spending and shopping. This might even in some cases with people being in a compulsive buying disorder that they have. Part two, he says, is the consumer mentality that your only interest is just to consume, forgetting uh, the, uh, the notion that you should also be producing, too. This leads, to, uh, at, leads us to act according to our sinful nature, which opposes God. Paul gives us some examples and warns us about where this mentality can lead. Now, the works of the sinful flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, com uh, complete lack of restraint, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, discord, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, orgies, and things similar to these. Paul says, I warn you, just as I also warned you before, that those who continue to do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In contrast, Paul says that if we are to stand against the enemies of the gospel that threaten us, then we must live in harmony with each other. And he speaks to our hearts and reminds us of the blessings that are in Christ. And these are from the first four verses of our text. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being united in Spirit and having one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility consider one another better than yourselves. Let each of you look carefully not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of of others. Here Paul reminds us that we have indeed been encouraged by Christ, comforted by His love, made spiritually new and alive by the Spirit's work in our hearts, and blessed by the Spirit with the gifts of tenderness and compassion. The, Holy, the uh, Philippians had already brought much joy to Paul. Their partnership in the Gospel, their faith and their love, their generosity and all uh, uh, generosity all brought Paul joy every time he thought about them and prayed for them. But there was one more way that the Philippians could make Paul's joy complete. They could be like-minded, having the same love, being united in spirit and having one mind. In a nutshell, they could pursue a greater measure of harmony in their interactions and relationships with one another. These words have led some Bible students to conclude that pride and internal strife were problems in the congregation at Philippi. Uh, chapter four, in chapter four, Paul remarks on a competitive rivalry between two prominent women in the congregation. In growing congregations where there are members that are educated and gifted, there is always the danger of some members looking down on the less gifted and the less gifted envying the more gifted. Human nature always desires to minimize uh, one's weaknesses and exaggerate uh, one's strengths, while minimizing uh, uh, others' strengths and exaggerating uh, their weaknesses. Paul encourages us to strive for greater harmony with one another. Since we have been united with the Holy Spirit in a common faith in Jesus, one hymn writer puts it this way, our fears, our hopes, our aims are one, our comforts and our cares. Our, together. Christians who are like-minded evaluate all comments by the Word of God. They love each other with an unselfish love that gives without expecting anything in return and finds their motive in Christ's love. Like-minded Christians are united spiritually and agree to promote Christ's kingdom in the world. Paul directs us, do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty conceit, but in humility 
consider one another better than yourselves. Humility is not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. Let me say that again. Humility is not thinking less of ourselves, but thinking of ourselves less. True humility is a key concept in the New Testament. Uh, in the New Testament, it is a unique trait of a committed Christian. Humility is the opposite of selfish pride or of our corrupt and selfish uh, human natures. The world often places a high value on uh, places little value on on humility and connects it with cowardice. Uh, often places pride and assertiveness with manhood. Books and ex, uh, ex, uh, classes offering assertive training are effective means of uh, exercising power or looking out for number one are very profitable and uh, popular. But the attitude of a heart changed by God's grace is no longer me first, but you first. Christian, a Christian's attitude uh, humbly and lovingly places the interests of others before his own. And so some Christians have promoted this order of all people's interests. Think of joy, that is Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. Paul urges us to consider one another better than yourselves. He isn't promoting false modesty. He doesn't want Christians to neglect their spiritual gifts. He is setting down a principle that we should direct, uh, that should direct our relationships with others. A humble child of God, no matter how many or how few his gifts may be, will strive to take his neighbor's words and actions in the kindest possible way. He will happily recognize and uh, uh, respect whatever gifts the neighbor has. When a member of the congregation considers others better than oneself, a wonderful unity results. No one is looked down upon, but everyone is valued, and all willingly show kindness to one another. Harmony becomes practical among Christians when they help each other. When Christians strive to serve and help one uh, their neighbor in every possible way. The world's way is to take care of oneself. It considers the needs of others only when it uh, sees some advantage uh, for itself. But a Christian's concern is for his neighbor's uh, interests, and that will surpass the concern for his own interest. What a sure way to promote devout, heartfelt harmony among Christians. Now for two what-if Christians. What if Jesus would have asked his Heavenly Father, what's in it for me? If Jesus would have done that, then he would have never been able to face temptation as we do, and to suffer and die on the cross. He would never have been able to fulfill the law by living a perfect life. He would never have been able to atone for the sins of the world. He would never have been able to secure our salvation. What if Jesus walked into our church today? What would be his expectations? Would they be similar to my expectations? Would he be pleased with his people, our uh, praising his name in worship today? Two, a countercultural church isn't about me, but it's about we. We exist with and for each other. We tend to see some things as beneath us, but thankfully Jesus didn't look at the mission ahead of him as beneath him. He loved us so much that he set aside his glory and he humbled himself. Listen to what degree. Indeed, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Though he was by nature God, he did not consider equality with God as a, the prize to be displayed. But he emptied himself by taking in, uh, in the nature of a servant. When he was born in human likeness and his appearance was like that of any other man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Our sinful nature is not confined to humility, love, or service, but to selfishness. And so triumph over self is the great need that Christians truly want to, uh, need to have, and to put Christ first in their lives. Paul points out Christians to Jesus as both the perfect example and the ultimate source of strength for living lives of Christian humility. The more completely Christians come to know Christ, the more fully Christ 
and his love will be in their hearts. And the more they are in Christ, and Christ is in them, the more Christ-like they will be in their attitudes and actions. Not only are Paul's words here an encouragement, but they also expand then into a doctrinal statement. In my opinion, this is one of the clearest New Testament summaries of Christ's humiliation and exaltation. With a dignity of style, Paul tells us to see the divine mysteries in the person of Christ and the work which created our salvation. To appreciate Christ's humiliation, we must first recognize that He is in very nature true God. He is equal with the Father in power and authority and majesty. His eternal existence is unshakable and unchangeable. But Jesus did not consider equality with God as a prize to be displayed. He knew perfectly that from all eternity he possessed the majesty of God. But Jesus didn't consider this something to be exhibited or displayed for his own personal advancement or glory. And though he was very in very nature God, he did not appear on earth to glorify himself, nor did he arbitrarily use his divine rights and powers that he possessed to gain earthly fame and power. The mission his father gave him simply considered that to be linked with that to be a showy display of divine majesty. In humbling himself, Jesus emptied himself by taking the very nature of a servant. Human language struggles to, uh, to adequately express the magnitude of what, we did, of what he did. Of course, Jesus didn't empty himself as his divinity. He remained a uh, true, uh, true God. But during his earthly life and ministry, Jesus emptied himself of the full and constant use of the powers and privileges of his divinity. Jesus became like every other man in his manner of li earthly living. Though he himself was sinless, he took on our human nature and its weakened state, saddled with the effects of sin, and he placed himself under the demands of the law to become our substitute. For our sin, he lowered himself to depths which no other uh, man has ever gone when he came be obedient to death, even death on a cross. Christ's death went far beyond what any typical human experience is because it was the most shameful death one could die. It was excruciatingly painful death, and even more significantly, it was a death that was considered cursed by God. Jesus did all of this out of love for you and I. In this spirit of love, Jesus commands us, a new commandment I give you. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, so also you are to love one another. But by this everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. What if you don't desire to be served, or to ask what's in it for me? What if you don't desire a me church, but a we church? What if, one last word of question, what if you ask the question today, what can I do to help? How can I serve Jesus today? Amen. May, may the peace that passes all human understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand and we'll say together the Apostles' Creed. That's uh, on page 41 of your hymnal and on the screen. I believe in God.
Please stand for prayer. Now, God, let our lives for you be given, our years for you be spent, our ties to earthly goods be riven, our gifts with love to you be sent. You gave yourself that we might live, to you ourselves in all things give. Amen. We join together in saying responsibly the prayer of the church that's found on page 42 in the front. <clears throat> Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all you give us day after day. We are not worthy of all the mercy you show us. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach your saving truth at this place and everywhere. Grant them a rich measure of patience, wisdom, and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Heal those who are sick. Cheer those who are sad, calm those who are distressed, and comfort all who are old and infirm. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant your blessings to every nation on earth. Where there are wars, may there be peace. Where there is hatred, let it be healed. Where there is poverty, danger, or disaster, come with your almighty power to help and restore. Dear Heavenly Father, in our prayers this morning, we pray for John Fersha, the husband of Annette, uh, who has the procedure to uh, improve the blood flow of, uh, uh, to his uh, left leg. Uh, we know that he is in severe pain, and if it would be your will that you would lessen that pain and heal his recovery of his life. We know that you can do all things, and we pray if it is your will that you would do this as well. We also pray today for Judy Glenn, who had a procedure to remove um, uh, fluids that are um, affecting her internal organs in time. Uh, she will have to have uh, other surgery to remove a mass of tissue, we pray that that massive tissue is not uh, big and it's not uh, a spreading cancer and yet we, we don't know. Um, but give her time uh, here a couple of weeks to recover as she uh, lives with her uh, son Scott and his family. We pray that you would watch over her and always remind her that you are with her and uh, love her and uh, want what is best for her in her life. Uh, help us as her Christian brothers and sisters to encourage her in this time and support her in uh, her um, uh, in her affliction uh, that she is enduring right now. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask for all these things. Hear us as we bring you our private petition. We bring you these requests before you in the name of Jesus our Lord and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you, that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Amen. We join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.